Let's go. Welcome to the Trusted Leader Show. I'm your host, David Horsager. Join me as I sit down with influential leaders from around the world to discuss why leaders and organizations fail, top tactics for high performance, and how you can become an even more trusted leader. Welcome to The Trusted Leader Show. I'm Kent Svensson, producer of The Trusted Leader Show. And for this week's episode, we thought we'd revisit a previous episode where David sat down with M. Gasby Brown, CEO of The Gasby Group, author, visual artist, and nonprofit and philanthropy expert to discuss why racial literacy is critical for every leader. So sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. Let's jump to DEI. It's a big topic, DEI and justice, some say in belonging these days, but diversity, equity, inclusion. Um, you know, we talk about trust and it's you you can't it seems like you can't have the best kind. At least there was a there was a study on diversity, uh Har- massive Harvard Putnam study that showed kind of diversity that diversity of many kinds on its own tends to pit people against each other unless you increase trust. So we're all about how do we increase trust to get the best of that we know there, you know, we know there is greatness in diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging, justice. So how do we increase trust uh, so that we enjoy the best of this beautiful array of diversity? But I'd like to talk to you. How do you, how do you tackle DE&I in a way, or how can we as leaders maybe even think differently about it so that we increase trust and get the best of diversity? Boy, that's a great question, David. Um, And the onus is really more on the learnee than the learned, in this case, in my mind. And so it really comes down to, and I will deal with the racial part of it because there's so many moving parts to DEI and justice. Uh, there needs to be uh, racial literacy, a curiosity that uh, to learn, an openness to learn and to be a lifelong learner about the various historical issues that have led us to where we are now with regard to racial equity. There needs to also be, in my mind, I kind of deal with three R's, R's and C's and what have you, but Another R would be uh, racial humility. There are some people who feel that they have read a few books and they have watched a couple of movies and documentaries, and now they know all they need to know. And they maybe attended a couple of DEI trainings and they know they feel that they know all there is to know about uh, racial reckoning and what's going on. But that is the wrong attitude. The attitude has to be humility where you're putting yourselves in the position to always be open to learning new things and more. And then the the racial sustainability, that you're in this for the long haul. This is not just a flashpoint in history, but this is an opportunity to um, make change. And it starts with each of us. Where are some places you see people um, doing these things well? Like, you know, furthering racial equity in a, 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 where is it working? Is there places you can shine that are, that are examples for leaders to look at and say, okay, I never thought of that. I think I could, not just could I learn something here, but this would, this gives me something tangible we could start to do in our environment. Mm -hmm. I think the NBA has done a great job in this regard and worthy of studying their model of how they're dealing with justice, equity, and inclusion. It's so interesting because everybody's tall there (laughs) (laughs) in the NBA. And one of the big optics that uh, we use a lot would be everybody looking over a fence at different heights. And not everybody can see over the fence because of their height. And uh, that's where the justice, diversity, equity and inclusion comes in, because the more you adjust the height, the more everyone is in the position to see. But true equity is when you remove the fence altogether and everybody can see uh, where they are. And I think that's where 
we talk about that belonging part that you mentioned. Right. How are they doing that? How's the MBA doing? I know I've met the, the you know CEO of the MBA, and uh, certainly many of the I'm on a I'm on a uh, high point ex, uh, expert in residence with the uh, amazing uh, CEO of the uh, of the Mavericks, and she is a, an amazing you know uh, positive force in this work. But how, how, what do you see them doing? Well, I see them utilizing first of all their stadiums. With the health disparities during the pandemic, uh, and the stadiums were not being used anyway, what foresight and what what thought, what great insight I think they utilized and being able to say, we're going to take these stadiums and we're going to try and close the disparity, the health disparity amongst minorities with who were getting vaccinated or tested or all of the things that were a part of that. These are the real things. It's not in the the thinking about it, it's in the doing. So yeah, when absolutely. I saw them pivot along those lines, uh, that would be something that I would consider an example. And I'd love to hear from you, David, about the qualities that you've seen in those people that probably helped to lead them to a point where they would think this way. Well, I think the number one, you said curiosity here, I think was uh, uh, the onus is on the learner, either any way you look at it. But I, the, the great leaders I've seen deal with this and almost anything well have had a humility. I would say humility uh, of understanding we don't know it all, a humility of, of that, that leads to, you know, I guess you said it. Yeah. Number two was racial humility. Yeah. It was that exactly. I thought you'd said something before. So it's just, but it's just plain humility. And that leads to racial humility. It leads to kind of gender humility. It leads to a lot. You know, there's, but the, the, the thing that I've seen work is a start with humility. And go ahead. I, I, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I, it just brought a thought up about, I've seen so many CEOs and as I've navigated around in my professional career. And I see the ones who are most effective are those who walk in the room and begin to want to meet other people, not the ones who want everybody to flock to them and, and pander to them, if you will, because they have power and uh, authority, but the ones that just walk up to people and say, hi, I'm, Jane Doe or I'm John Doe and uh, and ask their name and then be interested in other people. I find being interested in other people being very important. That's an aside, but it was just a thought that came to my head that I found as a common thread that uh, CEOs who are most effective have that sense of humility and have the confidence that they can walk in a room and get to know people rather than being the center of attention. It's almost that I think I like what you said. It's almost a, it's a healthy confidence that you don't need. Like, you know, these these needy, uh, you know, if, if you're a CEO that needs the limelight or you need this or you or you need to be right. I, I just talked to a very good friend of mine, Phil Sterling, brilliant uh, gentleman. But he said, I no longer he, he, he said he, his whole life is is now like in these older years, like I want to be curious about how to solve the right problems. I no longer want to be right or something like that. His, his quote was much better <laughs> and he's, he's so wise. But I think, you know, this, this idea of curiosity about others, care for others, interest in others. Um, yeah, I, I think all that goes together. There's a whole lot more we could, we could say about this. Are there, are there structural things that you've seen that are working or you would recommend? I think, you know, people I'm on some boards where it's, there's, 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 um, you know, there's metrics. We are, we are, here's one idea that um, in one company, they changed the equity equation uh, by um, saying, you can hire the best person for any job who you feel like is best for that job. But there has to be a top three. And one of those three has to be a person of color. And and it it actually 
interestingly enough, this what some I could see, and I could see white folks possibly saying, well, that isn't, you know, that why do you need to do that? Or, you know, just I just you you could see certain things being said, and yet that just put certain people in the room. It it forced certain people to be in the room that actually from that group of three then the number that were hired as best of many more of color and the health of the company and the output of the company went up so they 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 found a way to get the right people in the room without without saying you know you have to hire 50% of this or that and i think it, it was one Simple idea. I guess I'm just asking your perspective on that. And are there other ideas that maybe we should be thinking about that can help, you know, start to solve this problem in our own spaces? Well, a couple of things. There is a name for that uh, procedure, and it's called the Rooney Rule, where the three are, are finalists are captured. One of the things I, I really have bristle when someone says, we're trying to find, when you're talking about those three, we're trying to find qualified uh, black people or minorities. Well, they wouldn't be qualified. They they have to be qualified to be one of the three. So what are you talking about? So eliminating that kind of lexicon is, is very important. I think it's also very crucial for the diversity, equity, and inclusion person to report directly to the CEO and president that this is not uh, someone down the line that reports to the HR person, but has the importance of being uh, on the cabinet, if you will. And then also it's very important, especially for corporations, for that executive committee to uh, be able to receive the frontline training and the hard nose training of uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice. And therefore, it trickles down from the top. Uh, if you start with the employees at a ground level, that is not the place to start. The entry level has to be at the top. And I'd also encourage white CEOs to seek training from experienced white DEI people who have walked in their shoes, understand some of their discomforts and uh, challenges, and it can be talked about in a very frank manner. So those would be a few of the things that I would recommend right off the bat. Yeah, those are good ones. Very good. Most training and development initiatives don't last or even solve the root problem hindering an organization. That's where Trust Edge certification comes in. Trust Edge certified partners are equipped with a suite of tools to identify, benchmark, and close gaps in trust for good. Because when you solve the real issue, you get measurable results and a culture where people actually want to make an impact. So whether you're a trainer, a manager, an HR executive, or a leader in learning and development, check out TrustEdgePlatform.com and see how you can start solving the root issue and get lasting results in your organization. And now back to the show. Speaking of motivation, and I don't always ask this one, but, you know, if you're trying to motivate someone else to do something, let's take a board or a leader or a someone else needs to change that you're dealing with. And many people think, well, motivation is just intrinsic. So whatever you want to call it, if you want to inspire them to do something, but you need to move someone to think differently or do something else. How do you motivate them? First, by finding out where they are, because I believe we have to meet people where they are. So to come with a formulaic uh, approach, oh, I'm going to teach you this and this is what you need to know, uh, in my mind, is not the most effective approach. The most effective approach is to find out where people are. So, for example, on a board that probably has an uneven pattern of understanding of a certain topic. Uh, first of all, do a little survey of how they feel about certain things. And to get uh, that in its aggregate and to have small group discussions so that you can have an understanding and they can have an understanding of each other, put things candidly on the table about it and discuss it uh, in a transparent manner. Moving from a, a base of knowledge about your audience is always very, very important instead of coming in with your own agenda 
that is just one way. Building on that, that would certainly be a huge part of it. Thank you for that. How would you go into a board, let's take a new board, and build trust? How would you build it? You build it, but how would you build it amongst each other? Well, through small group interaction, first of all. You know, I facilitate a lot of board retreats. And uh, doing the kinds of uh, things that help people to get to know one another. I ask them about well, what is something on your resume that no one else knows that you don't put on your resume. In other words, what is something about you that you don't put on your resume? And people come up with some of the most fascinating answers that then connect. It's almost like the St. Francis of Assisi. Oh, I didn't know you felt that way. We have something in common. And that getting to know you and getting to know others is a very important uh, part of trust. Uh, the fact that there is for people to be on a board, if it's operated uh, in the right way, that you know you're all there because you're offering something good. But to get to know the people that you are navigating with on a deeper level is, I think, very important. And that helps to build the trust uh, to know that uh, you think I'm okay because I climb hills and I do mountain climbing because you do that too. Right. And uh, I just went on a, I didn't, I don't do this, but for <laughs> a person to say, uh, yeah, I just went on a 26 mile hike. And the person is, you know, I did the same thing two years ago and begin to have that kind of interaction and and, and speaking in a, a trustful way. Uh, I think about uh, there's a U.S. Uh, trust, which Bank of America and Lilly Family School of Philanthropy Longitudinal Study that's done every two years for high net worth individuals. And one of the things that they have indicated in this study is that they trust nonprofits to do the work that they cannot do themselves individually. Isn't that a wonderful entry point? That speaks to relationship. And I think the bottom line of all that I just said, this long-winded way of saying it, relationship is so important when building trust. Everything of value is built on trust. We do a process that I am proud of, and it's had significant results in boards and organizations, but it's something we call the trust shield. And it just... It it basically is a process that helps people build connection and kind of see some of the things you talked about, like, oh, you can, oh, that, oh, I've had people with totally diverse views aboard that were just not working together at all. And one they they felt safe enough to say, Well, I'm a I'm a I'm a Muslim, well, I'm a Christian, well, I'm a this, well, I'm a that. And at the end of it, they all saw each other as human and they worked together in a whole uh new way it was a is it, it's it's a powerful uh powerful piece and yes so, indeed and yeah. in fact my book uh as you mentioned before business of a spiritual matter was written for that interrelationship between the abrahamic faiths and uh so it's it's very much uh tied to what we have in common it's a great book. Tell, give people a quick overview of of what they would get out of it. This is business as a spiritual matter, and tell tell just give a quick overview, Gatsby. Well, it's going to tell you about strategic planning from A to Z, and it will give leaders uh, all of the foundations as of a year ago that give to various nonprofit organizations. It's going to test leaders on uh, few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Are you chosen to be a leader and to really stretch yourself to think about what a chosen leader means? How to build a board. Uh, there's an author that I like. His name is Arthur, Arthur France Rip. He's passed away now. He wrote a book called Not On This Board, You Don't. And the dysfunctions of boards is something that I'm dealing with all the time. Clients are asking me to weigh in. And so in this book, it gives all the right tools to build a board, to deal in, in, in self-evaluation, self, uh, how to evaluate board members, how to retain board mem members, and uh, just from A to Z, what it's going to take, how to conduct a capital campaign. There's a chapter in the book for Christian schools in particular that says the bake sale will never be enough. <laughs> so <laughs> how, to, yep. I see it. how to conduct an annual giving campaign, all of these kinds of things that sustain a nonprofit 
with the right tools is part of a, the business of a spiritual matter. That's it for this week's episode. Be sure to check out trustedleadershow.com for all the show notes and links and information from anything mentioned in today's episode. And if you haven't already, we would greatly appreciate a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, or wherever you get your podcasts, as this is a great way to help support the show and help others to discover it. But in the meantime, that's it for this week's episode. Thank you so much for listening. And until next time, stay trusted. Stay trusted.